Here we're going to take a look at the source-free RLC circuit example from your note pack. Um, and uh, we're going to uh, develop the equations that is going to describe the output voltage for the circuit. Uh, we have a 12 volt source connected through a 12 ohm resistor and uh, also to an inductor in series. And at time one, this switch is going to change its positions uh, so that uh, we're going to disconnect the source and connect uh, the inductor directly to this 1 ohm resistor. And uh, we're going to develop the equations uh, that we're, are going to allow us to solve for how that voltage across the inductor is going to change as a function of time. Um, the way that we're going to uh, establish this is based on um, uh, the differential uh, properties of the, um, or the time response properties of these, this inductor value. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off by applying Kirchhoff's law uh, to determine the differential equation for the system. In order to do that, um, what we need to do is uh, First of all, before we do that, what I'd like to do is uh, talk about a model of what, what's going on in this system. So the way we can think about this is that before the switch closes, we have current flowing um, through, this, uh, through this inductor, L1. And um, before time zero, we're going to assume that uh, this circuit has been operating in this state for a long period of time. So uh, for a long, if it's been operating for a long period of time, this inductor is going to act simply like a wire. The magnetic field is going to be fully established and we're going to allow a lot of current to flow uh, through that wire or through that inductive element. So it's going to develop no potential across it and it's going to allow all the maximum amount of current to flow through it. All right, so at that time, the amount of current flowing through that wire right before we flip the switch is going to be dictated solely by the value of R1. So the voltage across this inductor, V out, at time zero, just before we uh, open the, um, or excuse me, just before we change the switch position here, is going to be equal to zero. And the current that's passing through that inductor, as well as the resistor, at the instant just before we uh, change the switch position, is going to be given by the input voltage, the constant input voltage, divided by the value of resistor 1. All right. <clears throat> um, we'll come back to what happens after time is equal to 0, uh, after the, the switch changes position in just a few minutes. But what we're going to find is that uh, we're going to use the property of the inductor uh, and the fact that the current through an inductor cannot change instantaneously, but the potential across the inductor can to determine what our initial condition is going to be right after we change the switch position. But before we do that, what I'd like to do is look at a fluid model of this system to perhaps uh, add a little more intuition to what's going on. Um, in the first case, before the switch is open, we have uh, a pump that is, uh, if you imagine, a closed uh, water loop system here. This pump is going to um, provide energy to uh, create a higher pressure area right here. And it's going to then flow through a restriction, which is our resistor. And you'll recall that uh, we discussed that um, an inductor is like a paddle wheel. So um, if this system has been operating for a long time, this paddle wheel is going to be spinning around and around, and it's going to have um, uh, mechanical inertia associated with this. It's going to have an angular momentum, and it's going to want to keep um, rotating. So as soon as we change the position of this switch, this um, inductor is going to still be in the system, but now we're changing the path that the water is going to flow. So um, after time is equal to zero, after we change the position of the valve or, the cha or change the position of the switch, since this uh, inductor has inertia to it or this paddle wheel has uh, momentum associated with it, it's going to still continue to push water through, um, through the loop even though there's no source attached to it, even though we don't have a pump. It's going to take some time for the mechanical energy in that paddle wheel to dissipate. And uh, that's the property that uh, we're, we're going to look at since there is, um, since this is going to continue to, uh, to rotate, we're going to have some pressure differential that's going to be established across this uh, resistor R2 or this uh, pipe restriction R2. 
Um, and that's the pressure that we're going to be solving for. Okay, so um, again, we know that we're going to need an initial condition. We're going to need to know what the output voltage is right after we uh, close uh, or change the position of the switch. We also know that as soon as we change switch positions into this circuit right here, we're going to have to have a current flow that's equal to the same value because the current flowing through an inductor can't change instantly. But the voltage across it can. All right, if we look at the fact that the current flowing through this at time um, just after the switch closes or changes position has to be equal to the same as it was before because of the property that the current through the inductor cannot change instantly. Um, we know how much current is flowing through that inductor. Now we need to determine the potential that's developed across the inductor. So the next question I, um, that we need to look at is what is that potential? How do we determine that potential? Well, we need to consider our conservation laws. Now, if I have a current that's proportional to this value, Vn over R1, at that very instant that we change the switch position, if that has to be flowing through L1, that means we also have to have some current coming into the top of L1. The only place that that current could come from is through R2, and it's going to have to um, satisfy Kirchhoff's uh, voltage law and current law. So that means we have this loop of current that's being established uh, in this R2-L1 um, circuit configuration. Also notice that um, our current through R2 is going to be going up, whereas the current through L1 is going down. That means that this side of the resistor is going to have to be at a higher potential relative to that side. Okay, since we know what the current is that's going from this side to this side, and we know the resistance, we can establish the potential that's developed at that time. So the output voltage that's due to this continuous current flow because, uh, because of this inductor um, is going to be the current that we know plus the value of R2. So that gives us, um, in this case, is going to be uh, this current value. And we also know that the direction of current is important, and that's going to tell us that if we measure the voltage across this resistor or this inductor, since they're in parallel, and we call this the low side and this the high side of our voltage, for the output, that it's going to be in the opposite direction. So um, in this case, since the current is flowing in the opposite, since the current is flowing from this side to this side, but we're measuring the potential, we're calling the high side up here at the top of the inductor and the top of the resistor, then this output voltage is going to be negative with respect to that. So that tells us that time zero, right after we close the switch, the initial condition is going to be Vn times R2 over R1 and that's going to be a negative voltage. <clears throat> okay, that's great. We've now established what the um, initial condition is going to be for this circuit. Of course, that implies that we need to determine the differential equation that describes the circuit. Okay, so let's go back now. We're going to apply Kirchhoff's current law right after the switch changes its position, so right after time zero, to come up with our current balance. And I'm going to do the current balance at this node right here. If I do the current balance at this node, that tells me that I'm going to have a current path through R2 and a current path through L1. So I'll do L1 plus the current through R2. Kirchhoff's current law tells us that ha that has to be equal to zero. Okay. The potential that's developed across um, the inductor is given by um, the inductor current to uh, voltage relationships. And we know for an inductor that um, the voltage across an inductor is going to be equal to L di dt. It's going to be proportional to the rate of change of current through the inductor. So that tells us that if we want to replace this um, term here for current, we're going to need to solve this differential equation. So the differential equation for the current to voltage relationship through an inductor is given by 1 over L times the integral of the voltage across the inductor integrated over time plus the initial value of current through that inductor. So I'm going to replace my inductor value, my inductor current, with this expression. 
Here the potential that's developed across the inductor is our V out that we're interested in. So we wind up here with 1 over L1 times the in integral of 0, um, integrated from 0 to time t of the output voltage, plus the initial current through that inductor. And this is a constant value, and actually we know what that value is. All right, now we have to consider the current through resistor 2. And the current through resistor 2, remember that I'm calling this top node the node of interest, so I'm going to have to look at the potential that's developed from here down to here. Just like we did, we're going to use Ohm's law, just like we did for node voltage analysis, and that's going to give us V out as a function of time, minus 0, I'm going to consider this the low side, or the low potential side of the circuit, divided by the value of the resistor has to sum to zero. Alright, so now we have this nasty integral term in here. I don't like integrals in my equations. I would much rather uh, solve uh, differential equations instead of int integral equations. So what I'm going to do to get rid of that integration is I'm going to take the derivative of everything here. All right, when I take the derivative, what I'll wind up with is 1 over L1 times V out as a function of time. All right, this term right here is my initial current, and that's a constant, so that's going to go away. When I take the time derivative of the constant, that's zero. So I'm left to contend with um, this V out term right here, which is 1 over R2. And if I take the derivative of V out with respect to time, I get dV out dt is equal to zero. Okay, so doing uh, some uh, rearranging here. Uh, what I'll wind up with is L1 over R2 times dV out dt plus V out is equal to zero. So that's the differential equation that describes how the output voltage is going to change as a function of time. We also know what our initial condition is here, so we have everything that we need to know to solve this differential equation and determine how it's uh, going to behave. It's a first order differential equation with zero forcing function, so that means that we have a uh, free response. And to determine the free response or the homogeneous solution, we're going to replace our derivative terms, our, uh, our um, output terms, with our lambda operator. Right, so L1 over R2 times lambda plus 1, because this is the zeroth order derivative of V out, is equal to 0. And that tells us that lambda should be equal to negative 1 over L1 over R2, which is the same as negative R2 over L1. Okay. <clears throat> That, in turn, is going to tell us that the solution to this homogeneous differential equation becomes V out, as a function of time, should be equal to some unknown constant A times E to the lambda t, which is also the same thing as an unknown constant times E to the negative um, R2 over L1 times time. To determine the value of this unknown constant, we have to set time equal to zero and set it equal to our initial condition, which we established before. So doing so, that tells us that V out at time zero here is going to be, based on our generic solution, gives us the value of the, uh, the unknown constant. And from our initial condition, we know at time zero that the value of that unknown constant must be the constant input value times R2 divided by R1. So our total solution in this case, uh, the equation that describes how the output changes as a function of time, is going to be negative Vn R2 over R1 times E to the negative R2 over L1 times time. So that becomes the function of time that describes how the potential across this inductor is going to change after we change the position of this switch. Okay, and if we um, go back to the notes and we take a look at that, we see that uh, we go through the differential equation model and we establish that differential equation model. We establish the initial conditions by um, recalling that under steady state conditions the inductor acts like a wire. 
and that the current through that inductor cannot change instantaneously. We established our differential equation with our initial conditions, and this is what we came up with when we solved that differential equation. And what's plotted here are for some different cases of uh, different inductor values, and we see that they start at some initial value, and they're all going to slowly and steadily approach our zero current condition. So after some period of time, all of the energy in the system is going to be dissipated, and the current um, is, going to, um, is going to be reduced to zero. If we look at that in terms of our uh, fluid flow model, our fluid analogy, that kind of makes sense as well because this paddle wheel is going to be spinning and since we're providing constant energy into it with this pump, it's going to maintain its rotational uh, velocity. Um, as soon as we turn that pump off and connect a different pipe network to this, that paddle wheel is going to keep on going because it has rotational inertia um, and over time what's going to happen is that initially we're going to build up a pressure difference and this side we're going to accumulate more liquid on this side of the uh, of that restriction than we are on this side so we're going to have a negative pressure difference uh, between this point and this point or sorry, sorry here would be a positive if we measured from here to here if we measured from the top down to the bottom it would be a negative pressure difference because we're accumulating more and more um, liquid or more and more molecules of water right here and remember that the current flow is proportional, or sorry, the, the mass flow rate of the water is proportional to current, and the accumulation of water is proportional to, uh, it's going to tell us about the pressure, and is uh, analogous to the voltage that's developed across the resistive element. So over time, we're going to start losing energy we're going to, um, as this paddle wheel is going to start to slow down because we're losing some of the uh, rotational uh, inertia. And eventually it's going to come to a stop at that time. We're going to have no current flow through the system and therefore we're going to have no accumulation of um, water uh, or pressure across this restriction in the, in the system.